Welcome to Philosophy 102, Introduction to Logic. My name is Cecilia Moon. This is part two of lesson 10 online lecture. This will be the final online lecture for this course. In part one of lesson 10 online lecture, we discussed the following questions. What are three things to keep in mind when interpreting arguments? What are fallacies? What are some differences between informal and formal fallacies? And what are fallacies of relevance? In part two of lesson 10, we will be discussing the following questions. What are fallacies of weak induction? What are fallacies of presumption? What are fallacies of ambiguity? What are fallacies of grammatical analogy? And what are some things to consider when evaluating and constructing any argument in the real world? So now let's first turn to fallacies of weak induction. Fallacies of weak induction are weak inductive arguments in which the premises are relevant to the conclusion but fail to provide sufficient support for the truth of the conclusion. Now, as we discussed in part one of lesson 10, fallacies of weak induction constitute a subcategory of informal fallacies. Fallacies of weak induction are always going to be inductive arguments, and they differ from fallacies of relevance in the sense that the premises that these fallacies of weak induction rely on are actually relevant to the truth of the conclusion. The problem with all these fallacies, however, which is why they're called fallacies of weak induction, is that all these fallacies rely on premises that do not provide sufficient support for the truth of the conclusion. So although the premises are relevant, they're not enough to suggest or for us to infer that the conclusion will be probably true. We will deal specifically with six fallacies of weak induction. And these are appeal to unqualified authority, appeal to ignorance, hasty generalization, false cause, and false cause will actually be split up into several different categories, that of post hoc ergo proctor hoc, non causa pro causa, oversimplified cause, and the gambler's fallacy. And then we'll focus also on slippery slope fallacy and the weak analogy. Now, some of these informal fallacies of weak induction are actually argument forms that have been introduced to you in previous lectures. So you should be familiar with some of these arguments. Now, let's first move on to the appeal to unqualified authority. The appeal to unqualified authority has the following framework. As its premises, it observes that some person or source believes or stated that some statement X is true. Then as the conclusion, it asserts that one should accept the truth of the statement X or some statement that follows from that statement X. Now, this general form or framework is actually associated with both weak versions and strong versions. The weak version is referred to as the appeal to unqualified authority, and the strong version is actually referred to as the appeal to authority. So let's look at an example of the fallacious appeal to unqualified authority, which is the weak version of this form. Our example one is an example of the fallacious appeal to unqualified authority, and it argues that my Aunt Sally said eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids is good for your skin. She's not a doctor or knows anything about nutrition in the body, but that's what she said. So it's probably true that eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids is good for your skin. Now the premise of this argument is, my Aunt Sally said eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids is good for your skin. And notice how this premise is suggesting or citing that some sort of authority, in this case Aunt Sally, has said or stated or believes something to be the case. Now the conclusion concludes, so it's probably true that eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids is good for your skin. So the conclusion actually reasserts what the authority that's being cited has said. Now the problem with this argument is that Sally doesn't seem to be a very reliable source of information regarding nutrition. Now we know this to be the case because when the argument was presented, we we're actually given contextual information that helps us understand the argument a little bit more, but does not actually work as either premise or conclusion to the argument. So that bit of information is a statement, she's not a doctor or knows anything about nutrition and the body. So this statement actually tells us that Sally is not an expert in nutrition or the body. So she proves to be an unreliable authority regarding information about what is good for one's body or one's skin. 
So this would be regarded as a weak inductive argument, and the name of this argument would be an appeal to unqualified authority. Now let's compare this argument with example two, which is actually a strong version of the same framework that the appeal to unqualified authority uses. Example two argues, my dermatologist said eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids is good for your skin. So it's probably true that eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids is good for your skin. Now the premise of this argument is that my dermatologist said eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids is good for your skin. So like the fallacious version of this argument form, you have as a premise an observation that some person or source had said something. In this case, you have my dermatologist who said that eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids is good for your skin. Then as a conclusion, the argument concludes, so it's probably true that eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids is good for your skin. So again, like the fallacious version of this form, this argument concludes that what the source or authority that was cited in the premises said is true or probably true. Now in this case, in our example two, this is actually a strong version of this argument form or framework. And as a strong version, it is referred to as simply an appeal to authority. Now, what makes this a strong version of the argument form is that the premise relies on an authority that is actually a reliable source of information on the subject matter that the argument is about. So, my dermatologist is actually a specialist in terms of understanding or knowing how the skin works and what would be good for my skin. So I could rely on my dermatologist's information or knowledge that eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids would be good for my skin. Now here's something that you might want to consider. Notice that in both of these examples, in the fallacious appeal to unqualified authority and the non-fallacious appeal to authority, the conclusion is actually exactly the same. The conclusion is, it's probably true that eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids is good for your skin. And it actually happens to be the case that the conclusion is true. So in both of these examples, we have arguments that have true conclusions. So the fact that the appeal to unqualified authority is a fallacious argument does not depend on the fact that the conclusion is true or false. The reason why the fallacious appeal to unqualified authority is a fallacious argument is because the reason given would not strongly support the truth of the conclusion. So the fact that my Aunt Sally said eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids is good for your skin is not enough evidence for me to actually conclude that it's probably true that eating lots of omega-3 fatty acids is good for my skin. The reason for this is because Sally is an unreliable authority. She doesn't know anything about nutrition or the body. She's not a doctor. In the other case, however, my doctor is a reliable authority. My doctor is a dermatologist, so would know something or a lot of things about what's good for my skin, nutrition and otherwise. So here we have two arguments, a fallacious appeal to unqualified authority and a non-fallacious strong appeal to authority. Both these arguments actually share the same form or framework. Both of them, as its premises, observes that some person or source believes or states that some statement X is true, and both of them, in their conclusion, asserts that one should accept the truth of the statement X or some statement that follows from statement X. Now, the difference, however, between these two different argument types is then not the form or the framework, but the degree of strength that the premises provide to the conclusion. So if we look down at the bottom again, you'll see that I've given you another diagram to illustrate these differences. So the red line again represents the form or framework that both an appeal to unqualified authority and appeal to authority would share. So both of these argument types actually share the same exact form or framework. Now on the one end of the framework or form, you have weak versions of this form or framework. And these are weak versions specifically because the person or source cited in the premises are not reliable in regards to what the premises and the conclusion are about. Furthermore, these weak versions of this framework or form we will refer to as appeals to unqualified authority.
Then on the other end of this framework or form, we have strong versions. These are strong versions because the person or source cited is a reliable source of information regarding what the premises and conclusions are about. For cases of strong versions of this form or framework, we will refer to these arguments as appeals to authority. So here we have two different names, one name that belongs to weak versions of this framework and the other name that belongs to the strong version of this framework. However, regardless of the name, both versions rely on the same form or framework. So what you want to focus on in these kinds of arguments in order to figure out whether or not it's an appeal to unqualified authority or an appeal to authority is not to think necessarily about the form itself because that's shared by both of these types of arguments. But to ask yourself whether or not the source or person that is cited in the premises is a reliable or not reliable source of information. If the source is reliable, or if the person being cited is reliable, then you would have a case of strong appeal to authority. If the source or person being cited is unreliable, then you would have the case of appeal to unqualified authority. Appeal to ignorance is our next example of a fallacy of weak induction. As its premise, it observes that some statement X has not been proven true or that some statement X has not been proven false. Then, as its conclusion, it asserts a positive claim that statement X is probably false in the case where the premise asserts that statement X has not been proven to be true or it asserts as its conclusion a positive claim that statement X is probably true in the case where the premise observes that some statement X has not been proven false. Now, here we have actually two examples to illustrate this fallacy, which is the appeal to ignorance. Both of these examples are weak arguments, so they are both fallacious. Furthermore, both of these examples are examples of appeal to ignorance. Now, the first example argues no one has proven that aliens do not exist, so aliens probably exist. The premise that no one has proven that aliens do not exist. Notice how here the premise asserts that some statement X has not been proven to be true. So no one has proven it to be true that aliens do not exist. So the conclusion asserts that it's probably the case that statement X is true. Aliens probably exist. This is a weak argument because the fact that we do not have proof or evidence for something not being the case is not a reason that can actually support any kind of positive claim or assertion about something being the case. So in other words, we can never go from a premise that we don't know something to be some case or not to a conclusion of knowing something to be the case or not. Notice how here in this first argument, in the premises, we have an unknown being stated. No one has proven that aliens do not exist. From this unknown, we cannot claim then that something is actually true, that aliens probably do exist. This also works the other way around as well. So look at example two. Example two argues, no one has proven that aliens do exist, so aliens probably do not exist. Now, this example, like the first one, has as its premise a statement that no proof is provided for some claim. In this case, however, the premise is that no one has proven that aliens do exist. Furthermore, as the conclusion, it then argues that aliens probably do not exist. So in the conclusion, it makes a positive claim that something is actually the case, that aliens probably do not exist. This argument, just like the first argument, is weak because the premises are not strong enough in order to support the truth of the conclusion. Again, we cannot go from an assertion or a premise about not knowing something, about not having some kind of evidence, to a positive claim that something is the case. So we can't go from a claim that no one has proven that aliens do exist to a positive claim that aliens do not exist. So both of these arguments have the same form and they are weak arguments.
This form is referred to as the appeal to ignorance. And as you can see, there are actually no strong versions of this form. So an appeal to ignorance will always have this form and it will always be a weak argument. What this should suggest to you is that the form itself is the reason why this is a weak argument. The only claim that one can reasonably assert from premises about having insufficient proof is that one does not know anything. So the only thing that we can reasonably conclude from the premise that no one has proven that aliens do not exist, or the premise that no one has proven that aliens do exist, is the claim that we don't really know whether or not aliens do or do not exist. Now this is not making a positive assertion about something actually being the case. It's actually asserting that we don't know if something is or is not actually the case. So here again I provided you with an illustration or a diagram to show you the relationship between the appeal to ignorance, the framework, and the strength of the arguments. Again you see that the former framework is represented by the red line. And on the one side of the former framework, we have weak versions of this former framework. And the weak versions of this former framework are referred to as appeal to ignorance. Then on the other side of the red line, we have what would be strong versions of this former framework if they existed. But notice that they don't exist, which is why we have a big red X on top of this side of the red line. So, what is circled by the green circle is suggesting that this framework only has weak versions. And these weak versions are all referred to as appeals to ignorance. Our third fallacy of weak induction is the hasty generalization. And this actually should be a very easy fallacy for you because you've already been introduced to the fallacy and the framework. The hasty generalization has as its former framework premises which observe something about a sample of a particular group or class. Then the conclusion asserts that what has been observed of the sample can be applied to the entire group or class as a whole. An example that we looked at to illustrate this hasty generalization is the one given in example one. The example argues, I know five accountants and they are all crazy, so all accountants are probably crazy. The premise is, I know five accountants and they are all crazy. Notice how the premise observes something about a sample of a population, that population being all accountants. The conclusion then asserts that the entire population of accountants, basically the entire group or class which the sample was taken from, has the same property as the sample which was noted in the premise. So the conclusion asserts, so all accountants are probably crazy. Now we've discussed already how this version of this form or framework is a weak argument. And it's weak because the premises actually do not provide enough support for the truth of the conclusion. Specifically, the reason for this is because the sample size that is used in the premises is not large enough in order to support an inference from the sample to the whole. This version of the framework here is referred to as the hasty generalization. I also introduced you the second example as an example of a strong version of the form which is used by the hasty generalization. So example two argues more than 250,000 pregnant seals have been observed so far and they all have been found to give live births. So all pregnant seals probably give live births. Premise one asserts that more than 250,000 pregnant seals have been observed so far. So this gives you an idea of how large the sample size is of the population that we're concerned with, and that population is pregnant seals. Then premise two states that they all have been found to give live births. So premise two is making an observation about the sample that we have. Finally, the conclusion asserts that, so all pregnant seals probably give live births. So the conclusion is applying the property or quality or characteristic that was observed in the premises of the sample to the entire population which the sample was taken from. So it applies the property of giving live births to all pregnant seals. This is a strong version of the form given here, which is also used by the hasty generalization. However, strong versions of this form is not referred to as the hasty generalization, but is simply referred to as an inductive generalization. 
So on the bottom, you can see another diagram which illustrates the relationship between the names and the framework and the strength. Once again, the red line represents the single form or framework. And this single form or framework is shared by both the hasty generalization on one end and the inductive generalization on the other end. Furthermore, the hasty generalization refers to the weak version of this form or framework. And these versions of the former framework are weak because either the sample is not representative, the sample is irrelevant, or the sample is too small. So you can actually have several different reasons for why you would have a hasty generalization. Then, in the end where we have the inductive generalizations, these would be strong versions of the form or the framework. And these arguments would be strong versions because the sample used in the premises is representative, it is relevant, and it's large enough. So in order for you to have strong versions of this former framework, it must be the case that all three of these conditions are met. The sample must be representative, the sample must be relevant, and the sample must be large enough in order for it to support an inference from the sample to the whole population. Our next fallacy of weak induction is the false cause, and this is another form or framework that you should be familiar with because we have introduced it to you in previous lectures. Now the framework for a false cause is as follows. The premise or premises observes a correlation between two or more things or class of things, x, y, z, etc. The conclusion then asserts that one of the things or class of things x observed caused the other things or class of things y, z, etc. observed. Now, this kind of form or framework actually has fallacious versions and strong versions as well. The strong versions of this form or framework are simply referred to as causal arguments, and we discussed this when we were discussing causal arguments along with Mill's method. Furthermore, the fallacious versions of this form or framework can actually be categorized into four subcategories. The post hoc ergo propter hoc, non cause pro causa, oversimplified cause, and gambler's fallacy. Post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacies are false cause fallacies because, as its conclusion, it asserts that one event was a cause of another event. But for post hoc propter hoc fallacies specifically, this conclusion is dependent on correlations between events that have to do with temporal sequences. So the premises for post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacies will be that two events were followed one by the other, and it is this temporal sequence of events that is used specifically to support the causal claim as the conclusion. Our example one is an example of a post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. This example states, there was a significant increase in deaths caused by violent crimes in the United States during the fall of 2001. During the same time, monsoon wedding was released. So monsoon weddings probably caused people to become very violent. Premise 1 states that, there was a significant increase in deaths caused by violent crimes in the United States during the fall of 2001. Notice how this premise observes a specific event that has occurred. Premise 2 then states, during this time, monsoon wedding was released. Premise 2 then offers a second event that is correlated with the event observed in the first event. Then the conclusion concludes, so monsoon weddings probably caused people to become very violent. Now notice that in the two premises, premise 1 and premise 2, what is being observed is not simply one event and then another event, but what's implied is that monsoon wedding was released around the same time as the increase in deaths caused by violent crimes in the United States during the fall of 2001. Now, because it's the case that this argument simply relies on the fact that two events occurred around the same time or one after the other, this is going to be a weak argument. And the reason for that is because simple temporal sequences or the fact that two things occurred around the same time is not enough in order to support any kind of causal claim. If you think about it, this makes a lot of sense. Because if that were to count as a good reason for making causal claims, then we could make causal claims about pretty much anything that occurs one after the other, even if it's the case that they're completely unrelated. So, post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacies are always going to be fallacious, specifically because they rely on events in the premises that are correlated due to temporal sequences.
The next kind of false cause is non causa pro causa. Non causa pro causa fallacy is also a type of false cause fallacy because it's a fallacious argument that concludes a causal claim between one event and the other. Non causa pro causa fallacies, however, unlike post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacies, do not rely on premises that observe correlations between events due to temporal sequences, due to the fact that two things occurred around the same time with each other or that two things occurred one after the other. For example, consider this argument. Let's say that someone argued that text messaging causes young adults to experiment more with drugs, alcohol, and sex. And for premises in support of this causal claim as a conclusion, the person noted that there's a high correlation between text messaging or the amount that a young adult text messages and their experiences with drugs, alcohol, and sex. This kind of argument would not be an example of a post hoc ergo propter hoc because the argument is not citing any kind of correlation based on temporal sequencing. It's not citing that the two events, young adults text messaging and young adults experimenting with alcohol, drugs, and sex are not being correlated based on the fact that they are either occurring around the same time or that these things are happening one after the other. Rather, the correlation that is being observed of these events would be about statistical correlations, that basically the same percentage or a similar percentage of those young adults who text message a lot also have experimented with alcohol, drugs, and sex. One way of understanding why this is first a non-causa pro-causa fallacy as well as a weak causal argument is that you can actually provide more reasonable explanations for why you would have these correlations observed in the premises. It's most likely the case that the reason why there's a high correlation between young adults who text message a lot and young adults who experiment with drugs, alcohol, and sex is because young adults who text message a lot are more social and being more social is more likely to introduce you to situations where you can experiment with drugs, alcohol, and sex. Our next false cause fallacy is the oversimplified cause. What the oversimplified cause does is it takes a very complicated or complex event and offers as its conclusion a very simple causal explanation. And it uses as its premises in order to support this conclusion very simple correlations between two or more things. For example, consider this argument. Now, if I gave the argument that because there is a correlation between the rise in obesity rates and the rise of big gulp sales, big gulp causes obesity, this would be a problematic argument. The reason for that is because the rise in obesity rates is actually a very complicated issue. There are multiple causes for why the rate of obesity would be rising. For example, the rise in obesity rates might be due to the fact that, number one, many, many people nowadays are not making making as much money as they have in the past. And nutritious food is actually more expensive than junk food. So it's the case that not very many people are able to afford the kind of nutritious food that they were able to afford before. Furthermore, because of the cutbacks in federal funding for education, many schools have had to either cut back or cut out their physical education program. This means that many students are no longer given the opportunity to exercise as well as encouraged to exercise during the school day. Furthermore, there has been a prevalence in usage of technology such that not only young adults but also adults spend a lot of time these days in front of the computer or in front of a video game. All these factors combined would probably be at least part of the explanation of the rise in obesity rates. So the rise in obesity rate is not the kind of event that lends itself to a very simple causal explanation. And it is because of this that the argument that the rise in obesity rate was caused by big gulps is problematic. Finally, you have the gambler's fallacy. The gambler's fallacy is a false cause argument because it assumes that independent events of chance in the past will somehow cause or affect an occurrence in the future. An example of a gambler's fallacy is the following. 
Let's say that I go to the blackjack table and I've bet 29 red five times. And all five times I lose. So then I reason, well, I bet 29 red five times and I have lost. So if I bet 29 red again, I am surely about to win. Notice my conclusion is that if I bet 29 red again, I am surely about to win. And I base this conclusion on the fact that in the past, I've bet 29 red five times and I have lost. What's going on in this kind of argument is that there's an assumption that those five times that I bet 29 red are not independent chance events, but actually related to each other such that the conjunction of those events will affect the outcome of the same kind of event in the future. This is problematic because in terms of chance events like betting 29 red at the blackjack table, each of these occurrences are independent of the other. One event does not affect the other event. So it's going to be the case that any time you bet 29 red, you're going to have the same probabilities of winning that time compared to all the other times because each event is an independent event of chance. You cannot assume that all these events are related to each other such that they will affect each other in some way. One way in order for you to distinguish between these four false causes is the following. For the post hoc ergo propter hoc, it's simply the case that you want to pay attention to whether or not the argument relies on premises that observes things based on temporal sequences. If it's the case that the conclusion is being concluded from premises that simply observe temporal sequences of events, then it's going to be a post hoc ergo propter hoc. If it's the case, however, that the fallacious false cause argument is not using a temporal sequence of events in order to support the conclusion, but actually is offering a correlation of some other sort for which you can offer a more reasonable alternative in order to explain the correlation that's being observed, then it would probably be a non-causa pro-causa as long as it's the case that the correlation being observed is about something that emits itself to a simple cause, not a complex cause. However, if it's the case that you have a false cause argument where the causal correlations that are being made admits itself to a very complex causal explanation rather than a simple causal explanation and the conclusion is concluding a simple causal explanation, then this is going to be an oversimplified cause. And finally, the gambler's fallacy you should be able to recognize by premises that observes independent chance events, however, assumes when it's making its conclusion that these independent chance events are related to each other. Now, as I've mentioned, the false cause framework actually has strong versions as well. And our example two is our example of a causal argument which has the framework shared by the false cause. This example argues whenever water is exposed to a temperature of 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it freezes. So the temperature of 32 degrees Fahrenheit probably causes the water to freeze. The premise for this argument is whenever water is exposed to a temperature of 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it freezes. Notice how this premise observes a correlation between two types of events. Then the conclusion concludes, so the temperature of 32 degrees Fahrenheit probably causes the water to freeze. Now this is a strong causal argument and because it is strong it is referred to simply as a causal argument rather than a false cause. The reason why this is a strong causal argument is because the correlations observed in the premises are actually correlations that support the conclusion that the water freezing is caused by the 32 degrees Fahrenheit. One reason why these premises actually support the truth of our conclusion is that we have numerous, numerous, numerous numbers of these kinds of observation. These kinds of observations are made all the time when there is water and the temperature drops to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So here we have a very large number of these kinds of observations in order to support the kind of causal claim we're making. 
Furthermore, the causal explanation that's being given is actually consistent with our common knowledge about water and when water freezes. In other words, it's consistent with what we know today about water and water freezing. So there is no more reasonable alternative to the kind of conclusion that is being offered in order to explain the correlation between water freezing and it being 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you look down below here, once again, I've offered you a diagram in order to illustrate the relationship between the framework, the names, and the strength of these arguments. Now, once again, the red line represents the single form or framework that both false causes and causal arguments have. So on the one side of this framework, you will have weak versions of this framework, and they are all referred to as false causes. Furthermore, note that these false causes can be separated into four different types of false causes. Post hoc ergo propter hoc, non-causal pro causa, oversimplified cause, and gambler's fallacy. And these are all weak versions of this former framework because either one, the number of observations that they rely on are too small. For example, Post hoc ergo propter hoc may be susceptible to this kind of weakness, that the number of observations that this kind of argument relies on will be too small. Another kind of weakness, or another reason for why these false causes would be weak, is that the observations that are being used in the premises are irrelevant. The gambler's fallacy and the non-causa pro-causa would be fallacies because the kinds of observations that they observe in the premises are not relevant to the conclusion. And then finally, another reason why these fallacies might be weak inductive arguments is because there are more reasonable alternatives for the correlations that are being explained. Post hoc ergo propter hoc, non-causa pro-causa, oversimplified cause and gambler's fallacy may all be susceptible to having more reasonable alternatives being available compared to the kind of causal claim that is being concluded. So there may be various reasons for why any of these arguments are weak or fallacious and it could be that more than one of these reasons apply. But in any case it's going to be the case that these four false cause arguments are going to be fallacious. Then on the other side of the former framework you have strong versions of this former framework and we refer to these as I've explained as causal arguments. Now causal arguments will be strong inductive arguments because the number of observations are large enough to support the causal claim that is being concluded. Furthermore, the observations will be relevant to the conclusion. And finally, there will be no more reasonable alternatives to what the conclusion suggests. It's only when all three of these conditions are fulfilled that you will have a strong causal argument. So when you evaluate causal arguments, once again, what you want to do is you want to pay special attention to not only the framework or the form of these arguments and how these specific arguments work, but you want to ask yourself, are the number of observations being relied on too small? Are they relevant? And are there more reasonable alternative explanations? Depending on whether or not you answer yes or no to these questions, you should be able to determine whether or not these arguments are false cause arguments or if they're strong causal arguments. Our next example of a fallacy of weak induction is a slippery slope. Now the slippery slope is actually an example of a false cause argument as well. However, because it actually has a very distinct structure in terms of how the premises work, we're going to deal with the slippery slope as a separate type of fallacy of weak induction. The form of the framework of the slippery slope is as follows. The premises observes a chain of causal events, where the first event acts as the cause for the subsequent event, and so on. And each event carries more negative or positive significance as you move farther down the chain of events. The conclusion then asserts that the fairly insignificant event at the beginning of the chain will cause the event of great significance at the end of the chain, or that one should or should not bring about the first event in the causal chain. Now typically, the conclusion that one should or should not bring about the first event in the causal chain is based on first concluding that the event in the beginning of the chain will lead to the event in the end of the chain. 
This form or framework also has weak or strong versions. Example 1 is an example of a weak version of this form or framework. It argues, if we permit the legalization of same-sex marriage in the U.S., then we'll have to legalize polygamous marriage, incestuous marriages, and eventually marriages to non-human animals and inanimate objects. How preposterous would it be to allow people to marry non-human animals and inanimate objects? Well, that's what will happen if we legalize same-sex marriages. The first premise of this argument is, if we permit the legalization of same-sex marriage in the U.S., then we will have to legalize polygamous marriages, incestuous marriages, and eventually marriages to non-human animals and inanimate objects. Notice how this first premise is citing a chain of causal events, where one event is going to lead to the other. We have the legalization of same-sex marriages leading to the legalization of polygamous marriages, which then leads to the legalization of incestuous marriages, and then finally, the legalization of marriages to non-human animals and inanimate objects. Then premise 2 states, it is preposterous to allow people to marry non-human animals and inanimate objects. This is implied by the statement, which is a rhetorical question, how preposterous would it be to allow people to marry non-human animals and inanimate objects? This is suggesting that we don't want the last event to occur. Then finally, as the conclusion, the conclusion states, legalizing same-sex marriage will cause the legalization of marriage to non-human animals and inanimate objects. This is implied by the statement, well, that's what will happen if we legalize same-sex marriage. Now, this is a fallacious argument because the reasoning is weak. The reasoning is weak in this argument specifically because the causal chains that are being cited in the first premise are weak causal chains. The probability of the legalization of same-sex marriage leading to the legalization of polygamous marriage is very low. Furthermore, the probability of the legalization of polygamous marriages leading to the legalization of incestuous marriages is also very low. And finally, the probability of legalizing incestuous marriages leading to the legalization of marriages to non-human animals and inanimate objects is also very low. So because these causal chains are not very strong causal chains in terms of one causal event leading to the next causal event, these causal chains will not support the conclusion even if they were true. So even if it were true that legalizing same-sex marriages will lead to the legalization of polygamous marriages, because the truth of this is a very low probability, in other words, legalizing same-sex marriages will kind of, sort of, maybe lead to the legalization of polygamous marriages, these causal claims will not support the conclusion that legalizing same-sex marriages will or will most likely lead to the legalization of marriages to non-human animals and inanimate objects. Because this is a weak version of this former framework, we refer to it as the slippery slope fallacy. However, there are strong versions as I've noted. Example 2 is a strong version of this kind of former framework. Example 2 argues, if you try crystal meth just once, then you will most likely become addicted to it. Once you become addicted to meth, you will most likely experience strained relations with family and friends, health problems ranging from rotting teeth to death, and mental problems such as hallucinations and psychosis. Even just trying meth is a bad idea. Now the first premise states, if you try crystal meth just once, then you will most likely become addicted to it. This is the first chain in the causal chain that is being relied on for the premises. Then the second premise states, once you become addicted to meth, you will most likely experience strained relations with family and friends, health problems ranging from rotting teeth to death, and mental problems such as hallucinations and psychosis. This is a second chain of causal events that adds to the first chain in order to create a longer chain of causal events. Notice how where the first chain ends, the second chain actually takes off. So the first chain ends with, you will most likely become addicted to crystal meth. And then the second chain starts with, once you become addicted to meth. By doing so, these causal events are related or linked together such that they form an entire chain.
Now the conclusion concludes, just trying meth once will most likely lead to strained relations with family and friends, health problems ranging from rotting teeth to death, and mental problems such as hallucinations and psychosis. This is implied by the statement, even just trying meth is a bad idea. Now notice how the conclusion is actually suggesting that the first event noted in premise 1, trying crystal meth just once, will lead to the events at the end in premise 2. This is actually a strong version of this argument form because it's the case that the causal chains that are being relied on are actually strong causal chains. In other words, it's most likely the case that when you try crystal meth just once, you will become highly addicted. And it's also most likely the case that once you become addicted to crystal meth, you will most likely experience strained relations with family and friends, health problems ranging from rotting teeth to death, and mental problems such as hallucinations and psychosis. So here you have the case where these causal relationships that are relied on in the premise 1 and premise 2 are actually strong, such that if they were true, they would actually support the conclusion that trying crystal meth just once will lead to all these bad negative consequences. So in this case, you have a strong causal relationship, and so you have a strong slippery slope. Now one thing I want you to notice is the following. In both cases of fallacious slippery slopes and strong slippery slopes, you're going to have premises that rely on causal chains. Now it's going to be the case that if you have premises that have weak causal chains being asserted, then you're going to have a slippery slope fallacy. And if you have premises where strong causal chains are being asserted, then you're going to have a strong slippery slope. However, the way that you determine whether or not an argument is using a strong causal chain as its premises or a weak causal chain as its premises is to consider the truth value of the premises. So if it's the case that the premises are true, in other words, that the causal chains that are being asserted are true, then it's most likely the case that the argument is relying on strong causal chains in the premises, and so will support the truth of the conclusion. However, if it's the case that the argument relies on causal chains in the premises that are false, then it will be the case that the argument relies on weak causal chains in the premises and so will not be able to support the truth of the conclusion. What this should tell you is that there's going to be a correlation between the truth of the premises and the strength of the argument in slippery slopes. If you have an argument that has true premises, then you're most likely to have an argument that has strong inductive reasoning. If you have an argument that has false premises, then it's most likely the case that you'll have an argument with weak inductive reasoning. However, it's important for you to understand that Determining the truth value of these premises is simply a way for you to find out what kind of causal chain is being asserted in the premises, if they are weak causal chains or if they are strong causal chains. The strength of these arguments, however, is not dependent necessarily on the fact that the premises are true or false. Rather, the strength of these arguments actually depend on whether or not the causal chains, if they were true, would support the truth of the conclusion. If it's the case that you have weak causal chains, which is determined by whether or not the premises that asserts these causal chains is true or false, then it will be the case that these causal chains, even if they were true, would not support the truth of the conclusion. However, if it's the case that you have strong causal chains, which is again determined by whether or not the premises asserting these causal relationships are true or false, it will be the case that these strong causal chains will most likely support the truth of the conclusion, if they were in fact true. So, although it's the case that the truth of the premises will be related to the strength of the argument for slippery slopes, you should still keep in mind that the actual strength of the argument is independent of the truth of the premises. The truth of the premises only are supposed to help you determine whether or not the causal chains that are being asserted are weak or strong causal chains. 
then after you have determined that, you can determine whether or not the argument has weak or strong reasoning. 